welcome to a business break brought to you by Trouble Me Not Embroidery. My name is Katie Wubin and I started Trouble Me Not Embroidery a few years back and my goal is to make embroidery fun. So I recently was asked the question of when and how or why should I consider ripping stitches? Of course, at a glance, I thought this was an easy question and then the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, actually, I think about a lot of factors before I make that decision. So I wanted to just share with you folks uh, exactly what kinds of thoughts I have before making that choice to spend a little bit of tedious, torturous time ripping stitches. So I happen to be a fan of tea, so I've got my cup of tea. And if you're a coffee or a tea fan, I encourage you to grab your cup and take a little kickback to learn a little bit more about how to make your life a little easier in the world of embroidery. So first of all, let's consider cost. Of course, there's cost involved with the garment and something has gone wrong, so you're deciding, is it going to cost me more to replace the garment or cost me more to try to save the garment? Sometimes it, the two intermingle and you end up trying to save it but end up having to replace it anyways. So typically, when I look at the cost of a garment, I personally will say, is the garment more than $10? Is it 15 I might say, you know what, I'm just gonna buy a new one and move on. We'll have it restitched and out the door, no problem. Other times I look at it and I say, oof, that's a Nike golf polo that's $40, or it's a Carhartt jacket that's $60 or $70. Now I'm merging into that territory where I'm a little bit more willing to try to save it, even if I end up losing time, because that's a significant amount of money to have to just shell out. Plus a lot of times you're paying shipping because you need to meet a deadline, and you can't pair it with enough things to get free shipping, or it's coming from a company that doesn't offer free shipping to begin with now you might be up another ten or fifteen dollars just in shipping alone so of course when you're talking a fifty or sixty dollar loss you're a little bit more enticed to take that seam ripper and get to busy uh... ripping stitches another factor is the type of garment so when i look at the type i look at how sturdy is it if it's a carhartt jacket it might be a little bit easier to identify where the garment and the stitching are separated so it's easier to get that seam ripper working in there without catching the garment and causing a hole or distorting it. So I might be more apt to go after a sturdy item than I am a stretchy, really thin weight item. Those are easier to distort and that's going to cause problems with registration in your design. The integrity of the fabric might be compromised, so now you might get it finished but it might not last as long because you've kind of destroyed some of the properties of the fabric while you're ripping those stitches out. So keep that in mind too when you're thinking should I or shouldn't I? Try it or not. And of course what kind of stitches are on it because a wide satin stitch is going to rip out rather easily without pulling on the fabric too much. You're going to get away with a lot more when it comes to that than you are something that's really tight fill or really thin satin stitches that are really tight in small lettering, things like that. A lot of times I move on. I don't bother trying because it's just too much of a pain. Of course, you may end up destroying a part of the garment, but it may be not noticeable when you're done. So some items, you can get away with that if it's a tiny little hole and the fill stitching is going back over top of it. You've got backing on there to give it some integrity. Probably if it's getting a lot of fill stitches, you're going to get away with a hole without anybody knowing any different. Now sometimes you'll end up with a hole right on the edge of that fill stitch and that's not acceptable. It really has to be underneath all of the fill stitch to be able to get away with it. That being said, it rarely happens, but occasionally you get lucky and that's the case. Now I don't know about your customers, but mine tend to want things right now. So deadline is also a factor when I consider can I or can't I t rip those stitches out. So if the deadline is tomorrow and it's past the, to the time that I can order a new garment and have it delivered by tomorrow, um, then ordering a new one isn't an option. So then I look at, is it an item that I could pick up locally? So sometimes I can grab a sweatshirt that's very comparable to what I ordered in. Maybe it's a few dollars more, but I can grab it at a local Hobby Lobby or Joanne Fabrics. Now, sometimes I can't do that because I'm not going uh, 30 miles away. We're in a very small town, and once in a while I just don't have time to do that. I might call my customer and be real with them and just say, hey, look, this happened. I tried everything in my power to not have this happen, but it did. And so now I either need to delay your order or we can grab something from my inventory. It's not going to be the same, something similar. 
Um, or we can maybe send you on a shopping spree, see if you can find something that's acceptable and I can stitch on that. Of course at a reduced price because I made a mistake and now I'm causing you a little bit of um, extra work on your part as the customer. Usually they're happy to be a little bit flexible because they understand you're going out of your way to meet their needs and they'll appreciate your honesty and most of the time understand that human mistakes do happen. Sometimes you'll find that the customer has told you, hey, I need this by Wednesday, but really they need it by Friday. They gave themselves a two-day buffer for comfort. And sometimes you'll call that customer and tell them what's happened, and they'll say, you know what, you go ahead and delay my order. As long as I have it by Friday, I'm really fine. And then you maybe have the time to order a new garment in. So that's always a key factor is that good communication clearly stated with the customer. Um, a lot of times, all of a sudden, their need now turns into a, oh, I actually need it next week or a few days from now. So just talk to them. Once in a great while, everything in your power just goes against you and you cannot make this work. So another option is, let's say it's a Christmas or a birthday gift and you just cannot meet the deadline. The customer really needs it for that birthday uh, this weekend. Sometimes they're accepting of taking a picture of what that garment is going to look like and say give them a 20 or 30 percent discount for a late delivery. So now you can give them that paper they can wrap up and give in a gift. You might have to tell them this. They might not come up with that creative idea on their own. But you can then tell them, hey, go ahead and put this out there and then we'll get it to you later. Another factor to consider is how much time is going to be involved in ripping these stitches. So I may have another order going in. It's not really that big of a deal to throw another one on it. I've got time to meet the deadline. But do I spend the $15 on the garment or do I spend the time ripping stitches? So I like to ask myself, one, if I'm paying somebody to do it or how much money am I losing by not being productive in another way, is that really worth uh, saving $15? Because maybe I'm going to spend that in wages just paying somebody to rip those stitches. And also, like I said, you have to consider, could I move on to another project and have more finished product out the door today? If so, maybe it makes sense to scrap that item and just go ahead and buy a new one. So if you have the time and you're not putting other projects off or not going to meet other deadlines by ripping stitches and your deadline's okay, sometimes it's just best to just buy a new garment and move on. Or sometimes if you've got the time and the garment is rather costly, it makes sense to try and rip them out. So, you know, when it does come down to time to rip stitches, let's talk about how to do that. So when it's time to rip stitches out, I'll grab my seam ripper, maybe a tweezers, and I like to keep a roll of tape or masking tape or something of that nature, maybe a lint roller nearby, can of air, because what's about to happen is I'm going to attack the stitches in the most patient and reasonable way that I can so I don't destroy the garment. So a lot of times it's said that you'll work on the back side. I have better luck personally working on the front side. So I'll grab the garment and if it's a fill stitch I'll kind of just randomly pick away different little spots and make little slits in the stitches. And then I turn it over on the back side and take my seam ripper or tweezers and just kind of pull those rip spots up. And pretty soon I've got a majority of it worked out. On satin stitches on the top side I will just make one little slit down the center of the satin stitch and then flip it over on the back and start to just pick those out. Those come out pretty easily. Now what you'll end up with is a lot of fuzz everywhere. Debris covering your shirt front and back, inside and out. So that's where the tape comes in handy or the lint roller or the can of air. Spray it off or take the lint roller and wipe it off so that you get all that lint free from the shirt. Because the last thing you want is for the customer to get a beautifully finished product but evidence of ripping stitches all over it. So clean it up, make sure it looks as nice as it would had you not ripped stitches. There are also really handy little tools out there like Peggy's Stitch Eraser. Uh, you can pick them up for under $100 and you know if you end up finding yourself doing this a lot I would say invest in one. I've heard really great things, they have good reviews so if it makes sense go ahead and have one of those in your shop. It's going to save you a lot of time so if you think, okay, what do you pay your average wage uh, to your staff, or what do you try to make per hour if you're doing it yourself, and you say, all right, if this thing is 80 bucks, how many hours of ripping stitches do I have to do before that pays for itself? And if you've done that in the last year, maybe it's time to make an investment in one of those handy dandy tools. Your sanity is not worth more than $100, right? 
Another thing to do when it is time to rip those stitches is do it in little sessions. So I'll sit down for 10 or 15 minutes, rip, 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 and then I'll take a break. I'll grab my tea and I'll do something else for a while. And if there's somebody else that has some patience, you can take turns. Pass it back and forth, that way you don't end up really angry and threatening the shirt to light it on fire or piercing some large holes in it. You don't want that. Another time when I definitely am willing to go into that extra mile of ripping stitches is when the customer has brought a garment to me. So now I have that heirloom item or that hand cross stitch quilt that the great grandma wants me to stitch a from great grandma to whoever the kid's name is. And of course those are the times when things are more likely to go wrong. Now you can't find a replacement. You can't just make a new cross stitch quilt that took great grandma 40 hours to make. So in these scenarios I try to make sure things don't go wrong, but when they do, I try to always have a plan B. So when the customer walks through my door and asks me to stitch on that heirloom item, I will A, ask them to sign a waiver. And on that waiver, it says, I am not responsible to pay you or try to replace this item should something go wrong. And I, of course, tell them that I try everything in my power to avoid trouble. However, if it never happened, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So they understand up front they're taking a risk. And if they're not willing to take that risk, I'm not willing to stitch on that item. Some shops will go and say, all right, you're going to sign this waiver, and the agreement is that if I destroy your item, I will pay you $25, and I will not charge you for the work I had in it, we'll just move on. And if the item is worth more than that to them, the shop just doesn't take that order. Other shops just plain won't stitch on customer supplied items, so you have to choose a policy you're comfortable with and that's going to make you money. I mentioned a plan B. So on that cross stitch quilt that took great grandma 40 hours to make, I did four of them before I ran into a point where I had to kind of default back to that plan B. And plan B was covered up. So I knew working on a really thin broadcloth, if something goes wrong, uh, say a bird's nest, I forgot to put one of my wheels down for my active feed on my Bravo, or I had a situation where I spelled something wrong, put it in the wrong color, whatever it might be. Um, I had a policy with her that plan B was to cover it up. So at this point, it went wrong, I misspelled the name, and she picked it up and she said, oh, this isn't quite right. So instead of ripping stitches, I took some batting, you know, something you'd put inside of a quilt, put that over top of the area that was getting stitched over. This was to cover the texture of the previous stitching, the wrong stitching. And then on a new piece of broadcloth that matched a uh, color in the quilt, I stitched the correct name and all the correct information in the right color, and then I appliqued that on top of the ruined spot. So it ended up looking pretty cool. It was kind of an embossed type look when it was done, and nobody would have known that this happened except for her and I because I told her what I was doing. So it was a great plan B. It was successful. It saved the item. She didn't have to make a new quilt. I didn't have to uh, have her in tears in my storefront. So that was a really, really successful plan B. And I wasn't torturing myself by ripping out those stitches, which I don't think I could have done. I think it would have been a fail. They were very small letters. So let's talk about how to avoid this all together because do we want to torture ourselves? Not really. Do we want to spend extra time and money to fix something that should have gone right in the first place? Of course not. So how do we avoid it? First of all, we want to double and triple check our color sequence, especially when it's a customer supplied item. Take the extra minute to go over that color sequence, make sure that your threads are on the right needles so that you don't have an issue with color sequence or the wrong color. You don't want to end up with a red angel instead of an ivory angel. So those are things that you can do. And then another thing is, um, of course, to slow your machine speed down a little bit. I normally stitch at 1100 stitches a minute on my Bravo. Typically I can do that on everything but caps. Um, but on that heirloom item or something that's more expensive, the, say, Nike polo shirt that's a performance wear, really thin weight, stretchy fabric, turn the speed down a little bit. Yeah, it'll take a little longer to stitch, but you're less likely to have a loss. Also, when you're getting ready to stitch on an item, double and triple check your placement and orientation of your design. That will allow you to never be stitching something upside down or uh, have the wrong, wrong placement altogether. So double check if it's a left chest or a right chest. Make sure you've got it set up properly. If you need to, you're having a bad day, have somebody else take a glance too. 
And of course, supervising your machine is always a good idea, especially when it's a customer supplied garment. So in this case, I will, as I said, double check my color sequence, turn my speed down a little bit, and now I'm going to actually monitor the item while it stitches to make sure A, it doesn't stitch down to itself, maybe the back gets wedged up in there, or B, it maybe doesn't, maybe the machine has a glitch and it goes to the wrong needle or maybe I put the wrong thread on the wrong needle and I notice that and I can stop it before it gets too far along. And it just gives you a chance to maybe, yeah, you'll have to rip a couple stitches or stitch over something, but it's not the end of the world. Another thing that you can do too, I forgot to mention earlier, is if you're stitching along and you stitch the wrong color, but it's a lighter color than what it should be, sometimes you can get away with actually just backing it up and stitching over that design again. So it'll get a little thicker, but it might cover, and it might actually look better than having um, the rip stitches, because sometimes you can't get them all out. So that's an idea too. And if you need it to live on top a little better, throw a piece of water-soluble topping on it, and that will help the new stitching kind of keep on top of the old stitching, so that color really covers. I've actually gone over a spot twice to avoid losing a garment, and the customer never noticed the little bit thicker area. So you can get a little creative. So my Bravo treats me well when things go wrong because A, it has some features that allow me not to have them go wrong in the first place. So um, one of the things that I can do is in my software that runs the machine, let's say that I notice as I'm stitching that, uh oh, I've got the wrong color sequence. I, I actually chose this needle but I meant to choose this one. I can stop it and I can actually go in and change my color sequence while the design is loaded without having to reload the design and then I can just let it go and it will automatically make that change. Another thing it will do is a jump to or move to feature. So I can actually, like I said, if I'm stitching over a color, I can actually go into the software and in one click move it back to this color sequence spot and it will stitch that area. Then I can actually jump back to the spot I was at. So that's a big, big time saver. I love that feature. Another thing that the Bravo software allows me to do is to actually, instead of, so let's say I have a design that has 40 color changes, and instead of having to click for each one of those 40 colors, this needle, that needle, this needle, that needle, I can change it to active colors. So now I'm saying, hey, Bravo, 16 needles, here's where they are with colors, so I might have to click up to 16 times to tell it where each color is. And then from there, I can auto-apply, and it will fill all of those 40-some blocks. So, A, it's changed my uh, capabilities a little bit and made sure that I don't make a human error of choosing the wrong color for the, the wrong needle because if I get one off, my whole design's going to be off, which is really, really bad. And B, it's saving me a lot of time because in a click, um, it will fill my whole design. So then I always check the first, the last, and a random middle item to make sure that I have the right amount of blocks and that I am on sequence first, last, and some random middle one. So I love, love, love that feature. And I absolutely love my Bravo. It takes good care of me and I take good care of it. It's been a great addition to my screen print and embroidery business, which is called Pit Stop Printing. Um, I started Trouble Me Not Embroidery because I really, really found that I loved embroidery, even though I did not expect to. And I really enjoy sharing the creative side of embroidery and inspiring people to have fun with their business. It has a great capability lineup, a great starting point for price, and it has a very small footprint. So in my shop, it's about a six to eight foot area that we do our embroidery in. We've got two machines we run, and they paid for themselves very, very quickly, even in our small town of Lake Mills, Iowa, a town of about 2,500 people. One of the best parts is when you buy a Bravo from Trouble Me Not Embroidery, you get training with somebody like myself, or me for sure, if you want me, and typically we come for one to two days. We go over anything from your machine maintenance to how to hoop, what needles to choose when, and what backings to choose for different fabrics, all kinds of stuff like that. So you are ready to roll with embroidery regardless of your skill set going into it. So if you're ready, give us a call and we'll hook you up with a Bravo. And if you're not, hey, have fun embroidering with whatever machine you've got out there and keep on stitching. Thanks for taking a business break with me and I hope you have fun with your embroidery. And find us on Facebook, it's Trouble Me Not, and online we're www.troublemenotknot.com.